Hey everyone. Still kind of have less of a voice than normal. Um, but tonight, well, I have some tea. Um, Samantha and I are going to be starting a new series um, of talks and it's called Medical Chop Shop. And so we're going to be covering historical treatments that they did. So we're going to be talking about this stuff. Um, all kinds of different things and just bringing them to attention so that people can understand that medicine has always had many issues with it. It's always caused harm in many ways and um, it's never been like a perfect uh, scenario. So that's why we wanted to go ahead and do this series so that everybody could, you know, learn some of the issues in the past and take that knowledge with them to the future. So, hey, Samantha, how's it going? Good. Are you ready? Huh? I said, are you ready? Yeah. So this was kind of an interesting one to read on. Um, I didn't use the topic ahead of time to people because I didn't want them to go look it up like selfishly because we never, neither of us had ever heard of this before. I wanted it to be a surprise um, topic so what Samantha today is actually kind of like a couple of different things and you might have stumbled on the same like progression of this treatment type that I did but if not it might be new for you too what I, what I read about but um the first thing that I um that Samantha and I started researching was the this treatment that they used to do and they called it um it was like insulin induced coma is actually the name, the actual name that they use is escaping me. What was it? Yeah. It was insulin shock. Can you hear me? Yeah, it was called insulin shock therapy. Uh, therapy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, so what they would do everyone is they would give people large amounts of insulin to induce a coma basically i don't know how familiar anybody is with um hypoglycemic comas but they're very dangerous this is like a very dangerous um possibility that can happen to people with diabetes when they're like say taking insulin or when they're on other blood sugar lowering medications and um they actually use use this back in the 1920s to induce comas in people because they thought it was in some way helpful with their schizophrenia or their issues with drug addiction. Um, so what did you, did you want to start off and kind of like talk about some of the stuff that you found? Um, I will say, you know, anytime there's something introduced that's kind of new, but it looks promising, they always tried to say like there's a success rate of 80% in schizophrenics. That's a, this is what they said in the tw 1927. And I did want to say like, to me, it kind of goes with like the electro shock therapy, the ECT. They, they tried to say it's safe. Like, yeah. Like the death rate, like the possibility of dying is like, the same as a woman giving birth, like one in 10,000 or something. They try to make it, they compare it to a natural thing like birth yeah. versus like something artificial like this. And I think they do that just psychology, like psychologically to say, oh, well then it's not that bad. Yeah. Then. So people are, people are more open to receiving this science. And even like today, we're still doing like barbaric type science yeah. experiments and on people. And, and I did read that, you know, it's pretty much just toning the parasympathetic nervous system, which we talked about like in our group, just some slow, deep breathing and doing the box breaths every day or cold therapy, like cold plunges, those tone parasympathetic nervous systems. So why are we doing this insulin shot or why were they doing this insulin shot therapy at the time? It's beyond me. It's, yeah, it's something wow. that is like very, uh, it sounds like something from a movie. Yeah. Which there are movies. Did you see some of the movies that are about this? I kind of want to watch them. I think 
think you sent me a clip of one and I played it, but I couldn't remember what movie it was. But do you remember? Mm. Yeah. With Russell Crowe. I might have to pull that up and watch part of it today. Yeah. Um, yeah. So same thing as you found. So the guy that invented this, you guys, he was born in 1900 and he was a doctor. His name was Manfred Shackle. And Manfred Shackle, he studied neurology and um, neuropsychology. And he came up with this protocol. And just like Samantha said, he touted it around. And this was in actually what is now Ukraine. I think it was like, was it the Austrian Empire or something back then? But he touted it around as being 88% effective. And what was interesting is that his like colleagues and stuff, they were like, we're not finding it to be 88% effective. And they were disputing it. And people were saying, uh, there's a lot of risk, side effects, deaths involved. Um, but he still did this. He actually did it from, I think, 1927 to 1933 there in, um, oh, actually in Berlin. So he started off in, um, what's now Ukraine, and then he actually moved to Berlin where he practiced this, and then he brought it to the United States um, after 1933. So what was interesting about this, it, did, it never really caught on because it's so dangerous. Like, just like I'm telling you guys, if diabetic people get low blood sugar, that's actually more dangerous. There, there's two ways you can get a coma as a diabetic person um, if you're type 1. You can get diabetic ketoacidosis and you can get very high blood sugar, but your cells are basically starving. They're in like a severe form of ketosis. And when that happens, you can go into a coma um, or any type of diabetic, if they are on insulin or medications that lower their blood sugar, they can end up with hypoglycemic um, coma. So that is very dangerous and that can easily result in death and seizures. And I believe that they talked about, I can only find very few articles on this. It, it really is something that they aren't like, you know, just publishing information and talking about everywhere. Um, I found like two old like newspaper type or like uh, publication articles that I had to like, you know, enlarge and they were so short, there wasn't a lot of details on them, but basically it causes seizures in the people that can get brain damage and all kind of things. So very dangerous. But that is something that they used to do in the past, and they thought this was going to help people with their schizophrenia, help people with their drug addictions. But um, what it really did, and what Samantha and I are going to talk about too, is that it, it started <clears throat> off an entire movement of these coma therapies that they then just kept trying different stuff um, of putting people in comas to supposedly fix their mental disorders. And... Um, the next kind that I found, Smith, I don't know if you found anything about this, but there, they moved into, um, or this might have happened kind of simultaneously, but deep sleep therapy. And that one started, I have like some notes here, but there was a guy named Neil, Neil McLeod in Scotland, and he used sodium bromide on psychiatric patients to put them into comas, and um, he killed one of them. Uh, there was somebody else in... Italy, like a little while later, 1915, he started using barbiturates to try to, yeah, to, to get into these deep sleeps, but he found that it wasn't helpful. And then they started it up again, um, Swiss psychiatrists in the 1920s, they were using combinations. Um, one that I found was called Somnifen, and they marketed it by a pharmaceutical company that were giving that around. And it kept just kind of rolling on to the 1930s, 1940s. And um, even there was some people involved in the 1950s and 60s that it seemed like it was overlapping with MK Ultra. So, um, and then started with the, the electroshock therapies I think you were going to talk about. And then I'll talk about one more story. But um, the electroshock therapies, it, those started to combine in a, in a really interesting way. One thing that they did was they called it electro-narcosis. I don't know if you found this, but they delivered a shock to a certain part of the brain that would put the person into a deep sleep. But then they also found that a lot of people can tolerate the electroshocks when they were awake. So they started like com combining this. Then they were giving them barbiturates and stuff to stay them. 
and they were shocking their brain. Um, but so do you want to talk about what you found for some of the electroshock? And then I'll talk about uh, yeah. Harry Bailey. I don't know if you found Harry Bailey, but he's an interesting character. Yeah, I don't think I'm, yeah, I didn't really, I, I did write some like herbal remedies for depression and anxiety. Oh, nice. So that, that could kind of help maybe towards the end we can share a little bit, but yeah. um, it, they believe that epilepsy and schizophrenia didn't occur in the same person or patient. So they were like, well, maybe if we induce a seizure, people with schizophrenia will be in remission or whatever, or healed. So that's why they were thinking that inducing seizures in schizophrenic patients will help them okay. jolt the mental illness out. So I was like, interesting. <laughs> but yeah. um, yeah, I think that's about all like I covered with that. And then I went through some other like weird stuff, you know, in the 30s and 50s that they did you know, we kind of talked about them, but yeah, the deep sleep therapy with barbiturates is a good one to talk about. Yeah. And then electroshock therapy, which they're even still doing that till, you know, today. Yeah. And they call people like me, anti, anti ECT. I'm like, wow. So just add that to the anti list. Oh, they have. You know? They have an anti people like that too. I didn't know that. That's funny. You're like anything yeah, that like, they want to do to you, you're anti if you don't think that it sounds like a good idea. Exactly. I'm like, well, none of these people are talking about nutrition at all. No. They're just talking about this invasive they're talking about antidepressants and then they're talking about ECT and I'm, there's no nutrition at all. There's no lifestyle change at all anywhere. Yeah. And they're doctors. Yeah. yeah. It's absolutely crazy. Um, yeah, the electroshock therapy, I've known for a long time. So they used to do it for schizophrenia, but then they were like, oh, it doesn't work. Um, but it does work for depression. That's what they've been saying ever since I was an undergrad in psychology at University of Washington. They've been saying, oh, well, it still works for depression, so we still use it. Um, I guess using it for depression is a little bit better because at least the person is of sound mind enough to like choose it themselves. Um, whereas opposed to if someone has, you know, schizophrenia, which could actually be a lot of different issues from nutritional things to, you know, all kinds of toxicities, all kinds of stuff. Um, but those people might not even be able to really consent. So somebody else is like consenting to try this barbaric thing on their behalf. Um, so, well, the, I'll tell you a little bit about this guy, though, Harry Bailey, because what they actually started moving into <clears throat> was, and this was like uh, around the 1940s, 1950s, and I think he did it all the way, it was like maybe 50s, 60s, let me let's see if I can find the years, all the way, oh yeah, yeah, 1962 to 1979, and um, Chris, our friend, if you're listening, this guy is actually from... Um, Chumpsburg Private Hospital, which was Northwest Sydney, Australia. And although it looks like he went to Tulane too, I didn't realize that. Uh, let me look. Bailey worked in Louisiana with Robert Heath of Tulane University. So he was all over for a while, but he studied electroconvulsive therapy and he looked at these deep, uh, you know, this deep sedation therapy. So he ran this hospital from 1962 to 1979 in Chumps. It was Chumps for a private hospital. It was mostly just like an inpatient psychiatric hospital. And he did pretty much like he would sedate, deep sedate people for weeks at a time, like three weeks. Um, it sounds like, so it was very confusing because I watched a documentary on it, but I couldn't understand, like you would think if they were sedated, they should be intubated. Um, but I don't know if they were. There was like varying degrees of intubation or, or like of sedation that they used with these people. One person talked about um, their family member, I think had an NG tube in to feed them, but they didn't say anything about an ET tube. There was another person who had survived, survived through this hospital and you know the treatment and woke up and was vomiting they said blood and everything so i don't know if that means they were intubated maybe they were 
coughing up blood, but this person actually ended up with like lung damage, um, deep vein thrombosis because they were so sedated that they didn't move for like the weeks that they were there and they had to go to the hospital. Um, there were people in this documentary saying that they had horrible PTSD from this. Um, they said that 25, 20, I think 25 patients that went through this treatment of being sedated there actually committed suicide afterwards. There was a girl who her brother had been there and after he got out, he was saying he wanted to commit suicide. The, they, the people were so traumatized because in some ways they were like in and out of being awake. And um, so, and they were getting electroshocks also. And a lot of them were reporting and saying reports that they remember feeling the pain of the electric shocks. And um, there was, I guess, because they, they all, you know, they had mental health issues and stuff. It's like they were getting blown off but this lady, I don't remember if she was like an investigator or a lawyer for them. I, I don't know what her title was. I was just barely kind of like listening and reading and doing other stuff. But what she said was that she was like, you know that this is true because these people had actually never talked to each other and they're all saying the same thing. So it's not just hallucinations, but that's what, ha what they would say when people who had mental illness would complain of some sort of mistreatment they would be like oh well they're they're just mentally ill they're just hallucinating that all these that they remembered the shocks and stuff um but in reality that's what was happening they were like in and out of these coma uh coma states this one said comas lasting up to 39 days while getting electroshock therapy um so like i said 25 i believe people had committed suicide after staying in this hospital because of the trauma and everything and 24 or 25 actually died there in the hospital. Um, there was a woman, yeah, there was a woman whose husband who was only 22 or 23 years old. He had been in like, I'm pretty sure an automobile accident and he recovered or some type of work related accident. He recovered, but he was having really bad headaches and he was making an insurance claim and they said, go get evaluated by this doctor. And so she brings her husband there, they bring in the treatment, you know, they tell her she can't visit again, except for certain hours. She comes one day and she's like, he's so sedated. I don't think he should be here. You know, I want you guys to lay in the sedation. This is not what I thought he was going to be getting. And she comes back the next day and he's more sedated. He was the one I believe with the NG, the NG tube in. And then, so she's like, ah, this is not supposed to be like this. He's supposed to be less sedated. She tells the nursing staff, and, but it was nighttime or evening or something. And they were like, well, you just have to call the doctor's mom. And so she was like, okay. She leaves and she gets the call in the middle of the night that he actually died. Like he died. There was nothing really wrong with him. They, they tried to say he had a heart attack and all this stuff. But in reality, like he was so sedated and he passed away. Um, there was another girl that they talked about that was like 26 years old and she had been in a really tragic breakup with her boyfriend. She was like very depressed. And so she went there just for that. She was very healthy. Um, the nurses started to notice she was having like, it, it I would assume she must have had abdominal distension and maybe some sort of like bowel related issues or whatever, but she had dead gut. Um, she had gangrene of her intestines and everything, but it was ignored by the doctors, you know, this doctor stuff or other doctors. And she ended up passing away. And so they talked about that that was like when a light switch went off kind of for like a lot of the staff there that they were like, I don't really think that these deaths that they're telling us because the doctors would say, oh, they just died because this person was a drug addict and um, they've abused their body for years. That's why they had a heart attack. And the nurses were just like, you know, they were accepting this, but because a lot of the people maybe were in bad condition, but when they saw this young girl died, a lot of them started to get a lot of questions about it. Um, so this went on for years. The, the lady that husband had died at like only 22 or 23, she had a coroner look at his body, you know, they found high levels of barbiturates, but it was like no one ever did anything with it. And the deaths just kept going on and on. So it wasn't until I believe that maybe the 80s, even that they started to 
look into this further. Yeah, 19, oh, like 60 minutes. Sorry. I started to look into it in the 19, the early 1980s, and they started to investigate. And actually, the doctor, Dr. Bailey, they were starting to inquiries and stuff. He ended up just committing suicide before they could ever ask him any questions about it. So um, let me see what year he died. 1985. Yeah. So they were, they were investigating into it. There was several other doctors involved. There was actually one doctor who did not work at the hospital full-time staff with them, but he sent his patients there time to time. He was like a younger doctor. He was one of the ones that kind of like blew the whistle that he was like, this is not like these patients shouldn't be dying. Like he was like, as a psychiatrist, you know, you expect sometimes like one or two of your patients might end up uh, committing suicide like that he was like that could happen um he said sometimes like there could be a medication issue but he was like they shouldn't be dying during treatment and so i think he was maybe the one that kind of started to blow the whistle on them but um that was a very interesting story to me of just you know imagine some of these people were referred by their you know gp some of these people were referred by different, you know, other things like one, you know, that one guy, he just needed it for his insurance claim and, you know, to seek all the treatments or whatever. And this is what he, he ended up dying because of it. Um, so it just really highlights to you kind of how modern medicine, even, you know, even though that's less modern than we have today, it's always been like, it's always been a trial and error. It's always been, you know, um, it's like there's some harm comes with the good, you know, or whatever. This didn't even really seem like it helped anybody. But it's something that is very interesting where you have to really watch because, look, this went on for decades. Like something could go on for decades before anybody really notices, you know, what's actually happening. So, yeah, like everything, everything that's introduced is like, oh, let's take it on. And then it's always like a decade or a little bit later that people see like oh, oh crap why did we ever do that yeah and, and that's like that's the perfect point to lead up to the use of ozempic for weight loss right now oh yeah yes let's talk yeah you want to talk about ozempic for a few minutes yeah because to me this is i mean it's not as barbaric but just with like the black box warning and the off-label use of weight loss and yeah and I mean, obviously, pharmaceutical companies are just grasping straws on how can we make more and keep the every pill, you know, every pill for every ill or issue yeah. mindset. And this is one that's catching on like wildfire. We see it everywhere right now. Yeah. So it's definitely something that's going to, in a decade, we're going to be like, oh my God. Same with like the... 2020. Yeah. You know, it's um, very scary. I think even Elon Musk tweeted about being on West Covey. This. Okay. But yeah, I think Elon Musk actually even tweeted about being on West Covey and using it for weight loss. Personally, I don't think Elon Musk looks like uh, his body is anything I would strive for. Um, I have read reports, and I don't know if you came across this, but people saying that like, the percentage of weight from muscle loss with Ozempic and Wescovy, which are the same thing, it's semaglutide, um, which is a GLP-1 agonist, and it's actually used to treat type 2 diabetes, but they found off-label that they can use it for weight loss because it has the weirdest side effect that you would ever want for weight loss, but it basically, it slows gastric emptying, which is, it also seems like you, in my opinion, you would think you wouldn't even use this for diabetes because a lot of people with diabetes actually get um, gastroparesis, which slows the emptying of their gut already. So I, I don't know why you would want to give them something that's going to slow it down further. That's going to deplete their nutrient, you know, their ability to um, absorb nutrients and food and everything. And get rid of toxins. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Then they're going to be on stool softeners and laxatives for the rest of their lives too. So, yeah. Um, and it's weird. You can like Google side effects of it and, 
the biggest side effects are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, yeah. and abdominal pain. They don't mention hair loss. They don't men mention muscle, de you know, depletion. Yeah. They don't mention kidney function, yeah. new or worsening. Like you can have new onset kidney failure with yeah. this stuff. Um, the thyroid C cell tumors, uh, you know, thyroid carcinomas are included in that. And and those those warnings are hard to find. You have to kind of know what you're looking. For you have to literally type it up, you know. Yes, yeah. I think what I had to do, <clears throat> I found two different sites because I've researched this two two times. Um, one site that I found had, um, <clears throat> it was like a drop down menu, and then it started wow. you more and more side effects, and you could kind of click around. I think it was for people interested in it's being on it. Seven thirty. 7.30, sorry, my computer actually can shut it now that we're done um, talking about that part. But the other thing that I finally had to do was go to um, Nova Nordisk's uh, page and actually look at the provider information for a prescriber. And that was where I found the actual insert that shows, you know, the warning of the thyroid. Uh, I don't remember exactly. No, what was I have what was the MTC? It was like medullary, oh, medullary cancer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, risk of that. It also warns you if anybody in your family has had like MEN, um, which is like multiple endocrine neoplasms. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any any history of that? Like then you you know should be careful or get extra screenings or they're like they're like doesn't mean can't take it. Okay. Just, uh, we'll screen you more or some, something like that. It, it had some type of warning. I don't remember exactly what it said. Maybe it was, I don't think it was a contraindication, but it could have been. Um, but then it talks about, yeah, just like Samantha said, pancreas issues with the pancreas issues with the, the kidneys issues with your gallbladder. Um, I didn't see the hair loss. I didn't know about that, but there was the risk of suicidality and suicide uh, or suicidal ideation. I think I'm like, you're going to prescribe this to people just so they can lose weight. You know, what has the opposite side effect, the opposite side effect of making you suicidal is actually gonna make you feel better would be exercise. Like exercise is actually going to make you less depressed, less suicidal. You know, it's going to make your kidneys work better. It's going to make your liver work better. It's going to make your gallbladder work better. It's going to reduce your risk of cancer. So it's like, why would you prescribe somebody, you know, like a bunch of poison just to make the outside of their body look different, you know, but risk like all of the organs that you should be wanting to fix, you know, because they're put, you know, they're put stress on when you're overweight and everything. But you know, instead of trying to like fix that in a healthy way, it's like, oh, we'll just look better, but we'll risk cancer and stuff on the inside. It's like, no, like it's insane. Yeah. yeah, and I guess, yeah, that's what we were kind of getting to, you know, because yeah. all these things are very, they're complex and they're chemicals that are synthetic and they're never addressing the root of the problem. It's a lifestyle. Mm. And they and they want us and they have been let they've led us to believe for so long that our bodies are super complicated and it has to have appeal for each little symptom that you have or uh a, you know, something to help you lose weight fast. Yeah. You know? It's everything's like I need the I need relief now and I and I need to lose weight now. I don't want to have to work hard for it. And that's just what they have led us to believe that that healing and that getting fit and well is complicated when it's really not. It just takes consistency and time. Yeah. And yes, I mean it's a little frustrating, you know, but uh, people need to know that that you can heal from chronic issues, you can lose weight with like herbs, nutrition, weightlifting, and a little cardio. I mean, you literally feel so much better and you don't have any negative side effects. Yeah. And it's, yeah, you don't run the risk of being in some, you know, doc, what was his name? Dr. 
Harry, I forgot what his last name is already, but, um, experiment, you know, where you're like all of a sudden, like 10 years later, there's a, uh, what's it? There's like a class action lawsuit or whatever for Ozempic or, you know, I'm not sure there is now, but you never know when people start to have different issues from it, then you realize, what did I trust? these people with because that's how they roll the dice on it so here's how medicine works so you guys need to understand the doctor just has to follow um what's known as standard of care if it's if it's an off-label use but it's an accepted off-label use that's still okay you know um if it is obviously like they can't just go around doing anything they want off-label that wouldn't be standard of care, but I believe if it's off-label use, but it's used, you know, constantly, then I think that that's considered okay as standard of care. Now, Ozempic and all those, they're now approved. They have made formula formulations that are approved for weight loss now, I believe. And so that's standard of care. So they, no matter what happens to you, if the doctor prescribed it correctly, you know, they gave you the right dose, um they looked for any contraindications they didn't give it to you with another medicine that's gonna like cause like an amplified issue then they're fine you know even if it comes out to have another issue later that's not on them um when it comes to the manufacturers of the pharmaceuticals same thing as long as they're you know they don't necessarily have an issue that they know about then they're okay they're not going to get like a bunch of fines or anything now they can always get sued but the thing is is that they make so much money off of a medication then they deal with the lawsuits and worry about that later and we've seen that happen time and time again with different medications with them where you know they are liable for damages if they occur um, but a lot of times, you know, if it's going to be something aftermarket, they're just going to roll the dice. They don't have long-term data or studies already. So, um, so people need to understand that it's not like they've proven that this is safe. You know, they're just, this is the, the typical way that they roll out medications and then they kind of look for some issues later. So there's that.